Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today we are going to play Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor. This game is a 4X style game. You're exploring, you're exterminating, you're doing all the different X's that I can never remember the names of. <laughs> Uh, but in this game, we're going to control two factions, and we're going to try and take on both the Empire and the Chaos, and we're going to try and score more victory points than they do at the end of the game. Now, both of our factions need to be higher in victory points than both Chaos and the Empire. Mike has a playthrough of the prototype, and he's also going to do a review of this final version in a week or so, so make sure to look out for that. When that comes out, I'll put it in the description below. Also, John Gets Games has a great uh, rules explanation video as well, so I'll put a link to that in, uh, below as well. This game can be played for two to four chapters. I am going to set up a four chapter game. I'm going to see if I have enough time to record that. I'd really like to show the four chapters, uh, but we'll just see how much time I have to play. Now I will say this game is not short, so make sure you get yourself a cup of coffee or maybe a, a cup of tea, and let's start jumping into setup. The first part of setup you can do is setting up the board itself. You'll see on the rule book, it shows you the different ways to set up the game based upon the player count. So I have done the uh, two factions setup. The most important things to know is we've got unexplored sea towers over there and there. The rest of these tiles are random. You do have the capital here with single level garrisons, which are part of the empire in these three places, and then a level three garrison that's in the actual capital. For the chaos setup, you'll have a curse down here with one skeleton. We have the same on the other side. And then for our player setup, we'll have one haven in our starting location as well as our heroes that we have chosen. And we start on opposite sides of the board. You'll also want to grab all of the different dice types. I like having them laid out like this so they're easy to grab. You'll also want to grab five random Chaos Horde enemies if you're playing a two-faction game. If you play three factions, then you add one more to that. That'll be six and so on and so forth, up to four factions. I'm, I also did the same thing for the Empire, so they're legions. I've randomly drawn five of those and placed them over here. Next, I've grabbed one Chapter 1 event card, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, and Chapter 4, set them out on the board. I have placed my quests and my items. I'm going to reveal three quests and three items that we can purchase throughout the game. Now, in each of these stacks of cards, there are cards that have this skull icon on the top right-hand side or somewhere within the card. Make sure in your first few games you remove those. They are the harder cards, and you've got those for quests, you've got those for events, you even have those for items. Remove them. You don't need them. The game is hard enough as it is. I've drawn our three quests and our three items. None of them have when revealed effects. You do need to make sure you look at that for the quests. Some of them have an immediate effect. None of these do. So we'll see those as we play. Finally, on this side of the board, we do have our chapter track uh, token. I have that here. I find it super helpful to walk through this as we play. They did a great job of showing you all the different phases and making sure you don't miss anything. I also should have mentioned, this is a big game with lots of rules going on. Uh, it's actually really straightforward, but sometimes, especially when playing on camera, I'll make mistakes and I might miss that. Make sure to turn on your Klingon subtitles. Uh, if you see that's an option, that means that someone has told me a rule error and I will put it in so that you know it as you're watching the game. You also have these druid cards. You'll draw four of those, one for each chapter, and I've placed them out on the board in the indicated spots. Now let's set up our faction boards. This is the Moyer. This is one of the factions that I'm using. I'm using the other two that Mike used. Uh, so there's four that come in the base game. And then the expansion provides four more factions. So I highly recommend that if you like this game, you'll want to see if you can pick up that expansion because it'll provide a ton more replayability. Uh, you'll see here we have the four different unit types you have. You have two basic and two elite. I just have them all set up, ready to be deployed, hopefully. <laughs> we have four havens. One's already out. This will show us how much resource we generate, as long as that haven is still out during the production phase. Over here are all the different actions that we can take. These are essentially the same for every faction. There might be a couple differences depending upon the specific faction you're playing. But for the two that I'm playing, all these actions will be the same. We start with five Salt, 5 Plunder, 5 Food, and 8 Action Tokens. Each faction has two heroes you can choose from. Uh, you have two different sides of this. I have chosen Ronja because I think she's awesome. Each one has their own feat deck, and they each start with two feats out in play. So her two, we, she has uh, Wileys. Flip this card to use the Command, Haven, or Move action without paying the Action Token uh, and a Resource, which is really awesome. It's one of the reasons why I got her. 
Uh, the other one that she has is this can only be used during the clash part of battle. You can gain one skull, which is essentially one point of damage, for every Berserker destroyed this round, and that happens after damage. They did a really great job of telling you when certain things happen during the combat phase. I love that. They did a wonderful job of that. The other faction we're going to play with is the Druin. Now, the Druin, something I didn't mention. Over here, it tells you the cost of your units, and you're going to see the basic archer is expensive. <laughs> Three salt. Uh, comparing that to the Moyer, that they can do this with any two resources. So a lot of their uh, characters or units are more expensive, so we're going to have to make sure that we get salt for this uh, faction. They still have the same starting units, five of each type, plunder, salt, and food, and eight action tokens. Our hero on this side will be Syndra the Witch. She has teleport. She can pay one salt to place Syndra on any hex. She can teleport anywhere, which is really helpful. She also has Beastmasters. It can only be used during the clash phase. Flip this card to gain one shield for every Beastmaster here, and that has to happen before damage. We're going to make the Druin the first player, so I'm going to give them the first player token. The final part of setup is we've placed all of our victory point markers at the level 0 for victory points. And remember, how we win this game is both factions have to have more victory points than Chaos and the Empire. With this though, I think we are ready to start our playthrough, so let's jump in. The refresh phase will be quite quick during chapter 1. We have to reveal one druid card. We're going to ignore flipping all of our face down cards. We've already regained our 8 action points. We don't have to deal or uh, draw any new items or new quests or pass the first player token to the left. Let's go ahead and reveal our first druid card. Now these druid cards we can activate and you can see this we can activate during the archery phase or the clash phase. What we can do is place one of your units from any graveyard in any explored hex without enemy units. It can be done after damage once per combat. So what that means is if we roll this lightning bolt, we can use this and it says once per combat, so we can only use that during one entire combat. So that's multiple rounds of rolling dice. We'll only be able to use that once per combat. If that said once per round, we could use it for every round of combat. Let's now move to the event phase. So we can add two threat to all legions and hordes in play. There aren't any. The first player will read and draw the first event. That'll be for chapter one. And then we're going to place one activation token on every horde and legion card. If it was the last chapter, you do this twice. We have starving mobs. Hunger and despair turned innocent survivors into pans of robbers and thieves who roam the land. Your followers are doubling their efforts to protect your haven from this threat. Every player places one wall and one tower on their haven, which is nice. And in the sky, there were flickering lights behind the clouds at night, and the moons were blood red. Place one horde at threat four in the howling white, not adjacent to a haven. And then place one horde at threat four in the screaming sea, not adjacent to a haven. Having a wall and a tower at one of your havens, first of all, looks really cool. <laughs> You're going to place it like this. I'm also going to do this for the Druin on the other side. But what this will do is give us additional dice. So long as we have units here, additional dice when defending that haven. If we don't have any units in that haven, the walls and the tower are useless because there's no one there defending it. You can see here that the tower provides a white die for uh, archery and clash, and then just for clash with the walls, you would gain an additional blue die. We now have the opportunity of placing two hordes, yay, both at level four. So this one's going to be placed in the Howling White, not adjacent to a Haven. We know what threat level, first of all, because the card says it itself, but if ever you're unsure what level, so if, uh, a horde just comes out into play, it's going to be at the threat level equal to whatever the current event chapter is. So this one is at four. That threat level tells you a couple different things. We need to deal four damage to the counter of omens here in order to get rid of them. Each time you deal him damage, it'll go down by one. If it goes down to zero, you get this benefit. If destroyed, place two skeletons here and gain two victory points. Ooh, that could be really bad. It also will always have an immediate effect. Place two skeletons on his hex, and then it will also likely have some sort of special ability here. So if he rolls a lightning bolt, he will place two skeletons on an empty hex. And that happens after damage once per round. So if you're doing multiple rounds of combat, he can be throwing skeletons all over the board. Uh, so right now, since he's at a level four, if we attacked him, he'd roll three white dice during the archery round. And then for all the clash rounds going forward, if he stayed at the level four, he'd roll a purple, two blue, and two orange. 
but as he takes damage, he'll become less and less powerful. Just like when we take damage and lose units, we will have less and less dice. I really like how they say in the rules, you kind of think of this not as one character, but it's a horde of these enemies with him as the leader. So think of this as all of his little minions with him, and as he takes damage, uh, or as the horde takes damage, they have less dice to roll. Any of the sections of the board that do not have tiles on them will have a specific name, so like Howling White or Screaming Seas. So you can see all of these over here have Howling White. So I can choose to place this uh, the Counter of Omens anywhere on the board in the Howling White location, so long as it's not adjacent to our Haven. So I can't place it right here. I think to start us off, we'll place the uh, Counter of Omens here with his two skeletons. Here's our second horde, the Bloodworm. Nice and easy. Immediately, we have to place one curse on any hex with no X symbol. An X symbol simply means you cannot place a haven in that location. Most of those, at least at the beginning, are just locations that are outside of the tiles that we can reveal. But you'll see that sometimes there's other locations that have that symbol. Then he's a level 4, so he just rolls tons of red dice. If we destroy him, we'll gain 4 victory points. And up here you can see there's a number, number 21. That means when we activate these legions and the hordes, we activate them in initiative order from lowest to highest. So the counter of omens is a 13, so we'll activate that one first before the bloodworm. The bloodworm needs to be at the screaming sea area, which is up here, so I'll place him right here. He's now 2 steps away from um, Syndra. Well, I believe we have our work cut out for us, don't you think? <laughs> Let's move to the build phase. So first, we'll each draw two feet from the feet deck. Keep one feet. We have a limit of 10 cards, which includes any items, and put the other at the bottom of your feet deck. Then what we'll do is we'll build any units, towers, or walls. Just know that in each location, you can only have at max five units, and your hero is not considered a unit. You also can only put units into locations that uh, you have havens, or if you have no havens out, you can put it in the location where your hero is. Here are Sendra's two options. She either could gain an illusionist ability, or she could gain, you can see here, when you gain this, gain three resources, choose Leadership or Guile and place this under your card. I definitely am going to choose this one. I'm going to put this one face down underneath our deck. The three resources I'm going to gain is definitely Assault. And let's do um, plus one. We have no Leadership. Let's do plus one Guile. So we have two total Guile. For Ranja, she either has Tomb Raiders. When you use the trade action, gain one additional Assault. You may trade with heroes in adjacent hexes or her Crossfire. Archery. If you have two plus hunters here, gain one blue die before uh, rolling once per round. Definitely going to gain crossfire. We'll put this at the bottom of the deck. For the druin, I'm going to produce three sword sisters and two sons of the bow. That means I need a total of six salt plus three more salt and three total plunder. I have the six salt here for the two sons of the bows. Then I have a salt and a plunder for one sword sister, a salt and a plunder for another sword sister. And then right off the get go, I am going to use the ability that you can always exchange three of the same resource for one of any other resource. And that's, this costs no actions. So I'm going to do three food, turning that into one salt plus another plunder, so I can put out three sword sisters. I still have two food remaining, which is super important to be able to move your units around, and to plunder, hopefully, so I can build a new haven. They recommend in your first chapter to for sure try and build a haven, and to be able to keep some food so you can move your units around. For the Moyer, I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to do three cell swords, so that's uh, any six resources, plus any four resources to put out two hunters. We're using four salt, three plunder, and three food. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Once we have more than one haven out, we will have choices of where we want to place our units. For now, it's very simple. <laughs> We're placing them in our home locations. From here, we can now move to the action phase. So we each have eight action tokens that we can use. We'll go back and forth, taking turns until we both have no more action tokens to, to use, and then we'll end the action phase. Let's go ahead and talk quick about the actions on our faction board. So the two actions here, the move for your hero and the trade, you can do, and then that does not end your turn, so you can do another action with another action token. Any of the actions over here, if you do them, that will then end your turn. It'll be the next player, and then you'll keep going back and forth. 
The move action up here allows you to move only your hero and only to an adjacent hex. That hex can be unexplored and you can even cross any of the barriers. You do have a trade ability where you simply gain one salt and then heroes that are on the same location can share resources, which is pretty nice. Uh, we have command. This is going to be very important. You have to pay a food. You're going to choose an explored hex. So you cannot move units onto an unexplored hex. Move any of your adjacent units from any adjacent location into that one, a maximum of five, and your hero if you want. And then just remember units cannot cross those borders. Uh, you can explore with your hero. You can flip over an unexplored tile. Of course, you can't do that if there's a curse there. You can spend two plunder if there is no curse or enemy unit on a location that does not have that X. You can actually build a haven in that explored location. It has to be where your hero is, and you have to spend two plunder to do it. You can also spend uh, salt to buy any of the items in the market. And then finally, you can go on one of the quests that we have out. So lots and lots of options. Let's see what Syndra wants to do. I think the first thing that she wants to do is a move and an explore. So we're gonna have her move to an adjacent hex and then we're going to reveal an unrevealed tile. You can see on the back side of these tiles, they have different types of resources. This one has salt. We know that the uh, Durin really, really, really want salt. <laughs> Everything is so expensive for salt for them. So I think I'm going to have Syndra move here and flip this. We have found the Shadow Dawn. So the first thing is we get to gain two salt. So we go from zero to two. I like that. Then it says, if empty, so if there were any units on here beforehand, this would not happen. But since there are no units, if empty, we're going to place two skeletons here. If not, reinforce here. And we'll talk about reinforce when that happens, because I guarantee you it will. <laughs> For now, we're just going to place two of these uh, wonderful looking skeletons. You're also going to see down here that this denotes the type of terrain for this location. So this location is considered an ice waste. All the different locations have different effects in combat. Of course, ice wastes don't. There is no effect. So you have no benefits or detri detriments to any type of combat in that location. Ranja is also going to do the same thing. We're going to move our hero to an adjacent hex, and then let's go ahead and not quest. We're going to explore and reveal a tile. We're gonna have Ranja check this tile out over here. We'll flip this over. We're also going to gain two salt. If empty, place one garrison here. Ooh, easy pickings, I like it. Uh, if not, reinforce here, plus place one garrison on any empty hex with no uh, X symbol. I'm realizing that I missed this on the other one, this plus we have to do no matter which way we go on this one. So I think I have to do another effect on that. I'll check it in a second. But for this one, we have to place a garrison on an empty hex with no X. As crazy as this sounds, I think I'm going to place the garrison here, hoping that this counter of omens will move into this space and they can fight each other. Because yes, the Chaos and the Imperials will fight each, fight each other, which is amazing. Uh, except for sometimes when they activate effects that affect you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was actually not bad at all. On this tile here, it says place one skeleton with other skeletons. Now, what I haven't talked about is what happens if you have three skeletons in one space. Well, you discard all three of them and you draw a horde because it becomes a horde. So I definitely don't want to place a skeleton, if I can, with two other skeletons. I have a pretty good spot right here. That should be no problem. Now you're going to see I have my hero in this location with this garrison, plus I have the hero uh, Syndra with the two skeletons, but combat hasn't started. Combat will immediately start when you have units of opposing factions in the same location, but your hero isn't a unit. Think of your hero sneaking around the garrison. They have, we've discovered that there's a garrison here, but it's not very powerful. So hopefully we can go there, take it out, and potentially put a haven there. I purposely went this way for Ranja because I want to build the haven far away from that counter of omens over there and now with this advantage hopefully that garrison can help take a little bit of that counter of omens down to make it easier for us to defeat when it comes to try and take on our haven. Moving back to the Druin faction, let's go ahead and do a command here. We're going to spend one food, and by doing that, we're going to choose an explored hex. Move any of your adjacent units, maximum of five, and or a hero, and into that location. We'll move all five of our units into the Shadow Dawn. 
Because we now have units from two opposing factions, the Chaos Faction and the Durwin Faction, we have combat. There are two skeletons in that space. You can see here they only attack during the clash phase of combat and they roll two red dice. If there's only one, they only roll one red die. If they get the lightning bolt, they'll place one skeleton here after damage. If there's three skeletons in the hex, it actually becomes a horde. So we have to be careful. careful. Hopefully we can take them out. The game comes with this amazing combat sequence card, and I do feel like how they do combat in this game is wonderful. It's not too challenging to understand, and it's very straightforward, and yet it can be quite tactical. So we have our before combat. We check terrain, but remember we're at an ice, uh, what is that called? An ice waste? So it doesn't do anything. We could use feats or items that talk specifically about before combat. We don't have any. Then we'll move into the archery round where only archery units can attack. We're the only one that can attack range. So I'm really hoping we can do some damage. We've got two sons of the bow. Hopefully they can at least take out one of those skeletons. Then from there, we'll do multiple rounds of clash rounds until, and it, yeah, it says repeat clash. So basically one round of archery, then you do clash rounds over and over and over again, and then you go to after combat when it's completed. With our Sons of the Bow, we'll roll two white dice since we have two of these units. The game comes with this handy dandy dice distribution card, and so you can see that half the sides on a white die is a miss, one's a shield, Two of them have the skulls, and skulls are simply one point of damage. So that's what we're looking for right now. And two of them have shields. The so shields will be useless during the archery phase since we're the only ones attacking. You can see the best die, of course, is the black die. I don't have any black dice. Uh, and you can see here a bolt here can either cancel one shield or activates a specific god power. And we have that archery clash ability from the druid that we could potentially activate. Sadly, we're not rolling any dice that have the bolt symbol, so we won't be doing that here. Let's roll up our two white dice. Okay, great. We at least have one of these. That means we dealt one damage. With that one damage, we'll take out this skeleton here, and any time you take out a skeleton or any level of a garrison, garrisons can be up to three levels. So if I take out three levels of a garrison, that gives me three victory points. This will give the Durin one victory point. So we'll move up their marker to here, and they're now at one compared to zero from everybody else. Next, we'll move into the clash phase, and all of our units still get to roll dice, including our archers. So you can see why ranged attacks are awesome. So I, because you can first get that archery round attack, and then you still use them for the regular clash rounds. So we'll roll these five compared to the one red die for that uh, skeleton. Let's give them a roll. And it looks like to me, they have two damage here, but we have two shields and we have two more damage here. We're going to take out that skeleton with zero casualties. That is awesome. That'll mean we can take out this skeleton and we'll gain our second victory point. Ranja, who is cheering from the background over here, decided that, you know what, if she can do that, I can do this. We're going to spend one food. We have one food remaining. We're going to try and take on that level one garrison. Each garrison that's on the board, whether it's a level one, two, or three, is going to gain one victory point for the Empire at the end of the round. So if we can clear that out, we're essentially negating one victory point. Plus, if we kill it, we're gaining ourselves a victory point. We're going to move ourselves into the Raw Frost. Now, I'm going to pretend that I was smart. Do you see this right here? This is a barrier. I really wanted to put this this way. When you reveal a tile, you can place it any way you want. But I was so focused on telling you all the different things about it, I forgot to do that. Any unit, and this also includes any of the Legion or Hordes, cannot go through those barriers. The only person or people that can are heroes. Uh, so I've placed it this way. I will be able to move all my units here because they're not going through the barrier. But this gives us a little bit of a barrier between the uh, Empire from this tile here. We're fighting a level one garrison. That means they'll roll one white die in archery and then one blue and one white die during the clash phase. What's really nice though is we have our crossfire ability here. If you have two plus hunters, gain one blue die. So we have two hunters, so we'll roll two white dice, plus we'll gain the one blue die because of that. 
We're currently at an ice waste, so that means there is no terrain effect. Let's start that archery round. This roll is for the garrison. We'll roll this up. It's nothing. We'll then roll uh, two white and one blue for ours. And we have just one shield, so that's a miss. That means we'll move into the clash phase. We'll start with the garrison rolling these two. They get nothing. And then we roll three orange and two white for our clash. We just need beautiful. We need one of those skulls. That means we took out the garrison. So that garrison is toast. We'll gain one VP in that location. We can now build a haven. Let's move up our victory point marker. We're at one. I, we're still above them, which is good. <laughs> So far, I'd say our factions are doing pretty well. Let's now do a haven action for the Durin. Pl uh, pay two plunder. So I've got two plunder left. If there is no curse, enemy unit, haven, or an X in your hero's explored hex, place one of your havens there. We're going to build this haven. And what's nice about that is as long as it's out during the next production phase, we're going to gain three salt, two plunder, and one food instead of just three salt and one food. Not to mention, this location will also give us two salt because we have a haven here, and that's what that two salt means. Ranja is going to use her starting feat. It says here, flip this to use the command haven or move action without paying the action token and resources. We're definitely going to do that with, yeah, we're definitely going to do it with building a haven. This is a once per round effect, so we're not going to be able to use this again this round. Normally, this would cost two plunder. It didn't cost us anything. We'll place that haven right here. Syndra likes the idea of checking out that sea tower. There's usually really good things at the sea tower, and if you can build a haven there, you will usually gain additional victory points, which remember, that's the goal of the game. Sometimes it feels weird, but you have to remember you're going for victory points. So I'm going to move and then do another explore. We're going to move to this tile and then flip it over. And we have the Dune Guard. Gain two salt. Remove any skeletons here and place two garrisons here. Oh, that's actually not terrible. It says units and heroes that are adjacent, uh, are, that are on here are adjacent to any hex. If your hero is here, you can pay one salt less for items at the market. Part of the reason why I wanted to do this. Now I could place it like this. If I did that, that would mean if, let's say, there were skeletons here or there was a legion or a horde, they could not move directly into here. They'd have to move around. But I am thinking that I want to be able to get into there with units, so I'm going to place it this way. I'm going to move Syndra here, gain two salt. That means I have a total of four salt now, and I will place a level two garrison. What a level two garrison looks like is it looks like this, and it has this on top of it. Ranja is going to do a market action. She's going to gain one item from the market. Your hero can use according to your attributes by paying its salt cost. Now I only have one salt, but I'm actually thinking of buying this card for zero salt. This card is called Survivors. It says discard this. Every player may build units and defenses on their havens. So normally you can only do that during the production phase, but there's going to be times where all of your units get wiped out. It happens all the time. This will allow you to rebuild them during the action phase, which, if you ask me, is pretty awesome. In this game, you always have three items available for purchase, so you'll immediately replace it. And we have the Abad War Paint. This costs one salt. It's a clash ability. Discard this to gain one red die before rolling on your hero's hex. Now, I just want to show you one thing about items. Do you see that fist icon right there? That's your might. If, let's say I wanted to purchase this worm scale, I need to have at least a level one in my might, which for Ranja we have two, so we're fine. But Syndra actually couldn't buy this card because she has zero might. She does have three magic though, so she can use magic cards up the wazoo. So you've got to make sure to look to see if the card has a requirement like that. And you know what? Syndra's got an idea. We're going to also buy a card from the market. But remember, where we are right now, we get a discount of costs. Uh, that's because we're at a sea tower. So we can buy this for free, and we can discard this to gain one red die. I'm thinking of trying to take on that blood worm, maybe. Ranja is also eyeing that unexplored sea tower. So let's do a move action followed by an explore action. We still have two actions left. And of course, I forgot to reveal our next item, and we have the Horn of Yore. When you use the command action, pay zero food. Whoa, that's cool. 
will move and explore this sea tower. Oh my gosh, lots of walls or barriers. Well, I'm going to put it this way, I think, but let's read it first. Once again, units and heroes that are here are adjacent to any hex, and you pay one less when you're buying something from the market. Gain two uh, total salt, so we'll go from one to three. Remove any skeletons here, place three garrisons here. Oh, this is a level three. And you can see here, if we do get uh, one of our havens down here, we'd gain a victory point each round if we did that. Let's place it like that and a level three garrison. Is that going to be too hard for us to take out? Oh, man. But I've got all of those units. I really, really want to. Well, I'm sure you'd all like to see how you lose to a horde, huh? Shall we do it? We're going to command. We're going to use our other food. We are going to move into that blood worms location. So what we can do is choose this tile as where we want to go, and we can pull from all adjacent tiles. So we're going to bring a Syndra, and we're going to bring all of our units. Now, I could leave one unit back. It's not going to do much. It's much better to have all the units here. Let's see if we can at least damage this blood worm. Because unfortunately, it's probably going to go to our haven. Oh man, yeah, Let's. we're just going to do it. The blood worm is only going to roll two red dice for the archery round. Ha ha ha. Two red dice compared to our two white dice. Oh, look at that. Two blanks for him, and we at least deal him one point of damage. How that works is we'll move his threat down by one. So now he's at three threat. Now when we move to the clash phase, he'll only roll, oh, you know, three red dice instead of four. I'll, I'll still take that. We're, however, going to discard the Abad War Paint to add one additional red die to our attack. So we're rolling three uh, orange, two white, and one red. We'll give his dice a roll first, and that's four bloody damage. Wow. Four damage. That's going to take out all but one of our units. We have one, two, three total damage, which actually is enough to take him out. And he did not roll a lightning bolt. We did roll a lightning bolt. We're definitely going to activate this ability. Place one of your units from any graveyard in an explored hex without enemy units. We can do that after damage once per combat. That three damage though, one, two, three, it takes him off the board, will gain four total victory points, and he never rolled a lightning bolt, so he did not even place an additional curse. We were able to take this blood worm out. That will give us four victory points. One, two, three, of four. We're at six, which is kind of ridiculous. He dealt us four damage. We're going to lose all three of these guys and then one of these. What we need to do is place all of these units into the Chaos Graveyard, okay, because he's going to score at least two victory points for each faction of enemies that he has in, that Chaos has in their graveyard. So right now, they're going to gain two victory points for that. However, we did activate the Deep Dweller, so that means we can place one of our destroyed units back out on the board, and I am definitely going to put another one of my archers back here just because they're so gosh darn expensive. <laughs> we can place it in an explored hex that there's no enemies. Ranja has two actions left. Let's do another command. And we're going to bring in those units into the level 3 garrison's spot and try and take it out. We're going to sneak into this pass. We're going to bring our units into here. It is now 5 to 3. Oh boy. So we're going to move right into the archery phase. And remember, we're at an ice waste, so no effect. We're, we've always been fighting at ice waste. <laughs> there's other types. There's, you know, badlands. There's marshes. We just haven't seen any. For the archery phase, the garrison will roll three white dice. We'll roll two white dice and one blue die since we have two or more our, uh, hunters. Here's the three white dice, and they get one hit and one shield. Here's our attack, and we get two shields. So that means we literally did nothing during the archery phase. For the clash phase, they roll two blue, two orange, and a white, and they have four hits. That's going to almost deplete our entire uh, army. We have over here just two hits. So we're going to take out two parts of their garrison. We'll take these two down. We'll gain two victory points, but they're going to kill four out of the five of our units. We'll lose both of our archers, and we'll put them into the Imperial Graveyard, and we'll lose two of our cell swords. so we only have one cell sword left, but then they only have one garrison left. That is two more victory points, though, which I'll take. 
Remember that we only do one round of archery. So we're going to move directly to clash again, and they'll roll one blue and white. We'll roll one orange. Let's give the dice a roll, and we're each going to take each other out. <laughs> so we're going to lose another unit, but we'll gain another victory point, and we've cleared out that garrison, which is nice. That's one less VP for the Imperial. That also pushes us up to four victory points. Syndra will have to pass because she's used all eight of her actions. Ranja will go ahead and do a quest action. It's really tempting to do a haven action. I could put out another haven, but I think that I want to help my teammate, my other faction, uh, and I think I can do that by doing one of these quests. We're going to do Willing to Fight. After the Butcher's Scorched Earth Offensive, freeing the captives and arming them for their revenge was imperative. We can see here we need one or more successes, and we have three different options of ways to succeed. We're going to roll our hero dice, and we need to get three skulls, or one shield, or two lightning bolts. If we get two lightning bolts, no effect. If we get one shield, we can do this. If we get three skulls, we can do this. Uh, we also, as long as we get one of those, we can place a basic unit on each of our ha havens. Every other player places one basic unit on any of their havens. That's why I feel like I can help Syndra because Syndra's basic units, especially those Sons of the Bows, are so expensive. So I feel like that's super helpful. You can see here we'll roll two red dice, one blue, and then we can choose between a white or an orange, and I'm going to choose an orange. We're really just looking for three skulls here, one, two, three. Actually, we have one shield as well, so we did two of these, which is awesome. The first one will gain one victory point. The second one, we can discard any items from the market, but I don't think I want to do that because all of them are going to get discarded anyways, and I'd put out new items that we can't buy, and then we discard them, so I don't really want to do that. Then we're also going to place out two basic units, and Syndra will get to place out one basic unit. Syndra will place a Son of the Bow right here. We will place out a Cell Sword right here, and then a Hunter right here. Now, I do want to mention... All of the units that were destroyed so far, they've gone into the graveyards of the Chaos or the Imperials, and that means that they're not on my board that I can build or place out. So if, let's say, I had a way to put out another Cell Sword unit, I just wouldn't be able to do it because I don't have any here. Not until we get all of our units back from the graveyard and we place them here to be able to be produced again. So that's something to watch because these amounts are limited. After completing the action phase, we'll now move to the nemesis phase. We're going to activate the legions and hordes once for each activation token. Here we have the rules for activating a horde. So the first thing we're going to do is place one curse in the location where the horde is at. If there's already a curse there, then we just simply have them gain one VP. While I have one curse here, I'm going to place it in with the counter of the omens. Speaking of which, I realize I almost forgot my one victory point for completing that quest. I got all the three skulls on it. And unlike items, I didn't explain this either, quests don't get replenished until the beginning of the next round. So after I've discarded that quest, we now only have two quests out. Now we didn't do them. They're going to discard. We'll get new ones out. But yeah, just so you know, the quests, you only have three out per round unless you find another way to reveal quests. Now we can move the horde one hex not farther from the capital. Count the hexes that form a route to the capital if you're not sure. Remember, hordes cannot cross impassable terrain. While moving, only look at the adjacent hexes and then choose a hex with this priority. So first thing, they want to move into a haven. Well, none of the adjacent locations are in a haven. The next one is into a hex with enemy units. If there's no haven, choose the hex with the fewest enemy units. We know which one that is, so that's where they're going to move. We're going to have this counter of the omens try and fight this Imperium. Because he's at level 4, he'll roll 3 white dice, and that garrison only rolls 1 white die. Yeah, I'm not counting on the garrison doing great here. We'll roll the 1 white die first. Hey, that's a point of damage. And we'll roll the 3 here. Oh, that blocks the damage. So no damage there. We'll move into regular combat. The clash round. The garrison will roll a white and a blue die and the counter of the omens rolls just a few more dice <laughs> a purple two blues and uh two orange uh yeah that's three damage and a shield oh boy well that garrison likely is not gonna be able to do anything come on two damage here no they got two shields though 
two shields will block two of them. The third one, then we'll take it out. Ah, man. All right. Well, the garrison is gone. That garrison will actually be placed into the Chaos Graveyard. That means they'll gain two more victory points because they did that. And I was hoping the Counter of the Omens would take at least one damage, uh, but they didn't. We've finished the Nemesis phase. Let's go to the Production phase. We'll gain resources based upon your total havens. And then we'll gain resources shown on every hex with one of your havens. Cinder will gain three salt, two plunder, and one food here, plus one food, one plunder, and one salt from her starting tile, and then two more salt from the other tile that we have a haven on. That means we gained six salt, three plunder, and two beautiful food. On this side, we'll gain two salt, two plunder, two food, plus one more of each of those, so three of each, and then two more salt, so five salt, two plunder, or sorry, five salt, three plunder, and three food. So far, things are feeling pretty good. Next, it'll be the scoring phase of the chapter. We're going to score one victory point for the Empire for each hex that has any garrisons. Then one victory point for each legion, there's any legions, and then two victory points for every faction in the Imperium discard pile. That means the Imperium scores one, two, three, four, five, plus two more because they have one faction in the discard pile, so that's a total of seven victory points. They just jumped right in front of us. It's okay though, it's only chapter one. <laughs> We'll now move to the Chaos step, and they get one victory point for every curse in play, one victory point for every horde in play, and two victory points for every faction in their Chaos Graveyard. They have three curses in play, so that's three victory points. They have one horde in play, that's four, and they have two factions in their discard pile, that's a total of eight. So they scored eight victory points. That means right now we're losing to both of them. But fear not, we have not scored our own stuff yet. We'll slide this down. It says return all units from the graveyards to the reserve. I've already done that. Then we have we get to score. We'll score two victory points for each of our havens in play. So that means we'll each score four points for that. We'll score a point for a special hex. Each of our home bases are worth one victory point, so that's five. And then this last thing, really they recommend only doing that the final round. You can convert resources into victory points, and you can give that to any player. Because remember, every player has to be above the um, enemy factions. Right now, as it stands, we actually have the lead. We have 11 and 10 victory points compared to 8 and 7. Probably won't last long, but I will definitely take it. Okay, let's go back to that chapter beginning. We'll move to the refresh phase, which means we'll draw a druid card. Let's flip this druid card and see what we have. This can also be used during the archery and clash. You and your enemy ignore all skulls before damage once per combat. Whoa, that's kind of cool. Next, what we'll do is we'll flip over any of our used items. We only had one from Ranja, that's it. Then we'll recover all of our action cubes or uh, gems. So we're ready to have eight actions for the next round. We'll then replenish both our quest cards and our items, discarding any that are there and drawing three new ones. We've replenished our quests and items, but we do have a quest with an immediate effect. We have the Corrupted Druid. Place one activation token on the horde deck. The next horde you draw gets that token. Place one curse on any empty hex. Well, that kind of stinks because that means the next horde card we draw will get two activations. Ugh. Since I can place that curse on any hex, let's place that way over there. I don't want to deal with it and something that I didn't talk about yet with curses. If ever you do combat in a location with a curse, any of your lightning bolts have no effect. Only the horde gets to activate their uh, lightning bolt effects in cursed locations. So yeah, we don't want curses. Now we'll simply pass the first player token over to uh, Ronja, and then we'll move to the event phase. And you know what the first thing we get to do with the event phase? Increase the threat of all active hordes and legions out. Well, there's only one horde. It's this counter of omens. He's going to move from a four up to a six. If ever you get to the highest level and you need to push it up and you can't, they just gain victory points for the difference. Now let's go ahead and draw our chapter two event card. In the chaos of the days following the curse, many slave collectives and prisoners of the empire take advantage of the hour to revolt and flee. 
Every player may pay two resources to place two basic units on any of their havens or any explored empty hexes. Wow, any two resources? I will take that. We're each going to pay two salt, so a total of four salt. And we're going to place two sword sisters, one here and one here. And we're going to place out two hunters. Uh, you know what? Let's do both here. To set an example, the legions of the Empire move out of Nurengard to obliterate entire insurgent villages. Place two legions at threat 5 on the capital. Place one skeleton with other skeletons. If there's no horde, we can ignore that. We still have a horde. Our first legion is the Executioner. Now this is going to be at a level 5. We can see here an immediate. It says place her target. I'll show you what that means in a second. E, uh, every player places one elite unit from play or the reserve in the Imperium Graveyard. Well, I'm definitely going to choose them from the reserve because uh, I don't have any in play anyways. That's going to give them an automatic four victory points. Ouch. Every legion is sent out of the capital with a clear goal represented by its target. Every legion has its own target that is placed by its immediate effect. Choose one player faction with no target, then place the target on one of the faction's havens that has the fewest units. Each faction can only have one target, so we know the other one's going to have a target for um, Syndra's uh, in total faction. So let's put that one with Ranja. I had to pick this Haven because this one has less units in it than this one. We'll also place the Executioner right here. We have also each chosen one of our elite units, and we're going to place those into the Imperium Graveyard, which like I said, will give them four victory points at the end of this chapter. Our second legion is terrible, the Imperial Guard. Place its target, so it's going to be on Syndra's uh, faction, and it says place one garrison on every hex with a garrison. So every garrison gets leveled up, except the capital. Now normally, if you place a garrison in a location that already has three garrison, it just gains one victory point. If, though, that happens when you're doing it at the capital, then you just place a garrison on an empty adjacent hex without a garrison, or if there's garrisons all the way around it, you just level up a garrison from level 1, 2 to a 3. So here, all the garrisons that are out are going to get leveled up. We'll place the Imperial Guard in this spot, and he will be going towards this one over here, that haven, since it has less units. Then I have to place one skeleton with other skeletons. Thank goodness this one's two, so that would spawn something terrible, a horde. That would spawn a horde, but we do have one skeleton way back here that I will place, so we're set to go. The last part of the event phase is placing one of these activation tokens on each of them, and now we'll move to the build phase. For Ranja, she either can level up her leadership or her guile and gain three resources, or gain tricky. Flip this to roll or re-roll any of your dice in combat. This can be used only on your hero's hex. Boy, tricky sounds really good, but leadership and guile and three more resources can help me get out more units. I think I've got to go with the more units. So I'm going to choose this one, and I think I'm going to choose leadership. So that's going to give her two leadership then. Syndra's two options are also really good. We have here caravans. Items cost you one less salt. When you discard an item, gain one salt. Or she's got informants. Discard, discard this card when you make a roll outside of combat. Double the dice you roll. So she could just blow a quest out of the water. I feel like the caravans, though, is too good. It's always on. So I'm going to do this one, putting this one on the bottom of the deck. The feat that Ronja chose allowed her to gain three resources. She chose three food. This way, she can gain two berserkers and three of her cell swords. Now, this means she only has one plunder remaining. It's a little risky, but I do feel like we have food near to us. We can get that food so we can move some units around. Remember that all of the garrisons have leveled up, so we now have a level two here. I think I am going to place my two berserkers over here because we can only have a total of five units in each place so i have five here and then we'll place the other three our cell swords here on Syndra's side i really wanted to gain one of these rangers because they can attack range with purple dice how awesome is that but they cost four salt and two plunder and then we're also going to over here we're going to convert three salt into one food so we have three food and two salt so we can put out one beast master that means for resources left we just have one plunder and one salt 
We'll place both of these units here so we're ready to go and hopefully take on that garrison. Now we can move to the action phase and the first thing we're going to do is use our wiles for Ronja. We're going to flip this to use the command Haven and the one we're going to choose is the Haven action without paying the action token and resources. That means we've placed our third Haven out right here and this will gain us a victory point at the end of the game so long, or each round I should say, as long as this is here. And don't forget, we're adjacent to each hex from this location. So I can move from here to anywhere on the board, which is awesome. Syndra is in some dire need for food. So we are going to do a move action, but we are going to spend one salt so that we can move to any hex using our teleport. But that was our only salt. We now only have one plunder left. There's some tasty food right here. So she is going to teleport to this spot. Let's flip it over and we have Riga. So first of all, uh, let's see, wall to wall. Let's, yeah, you know, let's make it like this. There we go. And we gain two food. So that's, that's glorious. We really needed two food. If empty, place one garrison here. No, there is a garrison already there. If not, reinforce here. So that means we're going to place another garrison token on here. This is a level three garrison now. And we have to place a garrison on any empty hex without one of these X symbols. And as much as I don't want to do that, I think I'm going to have to place it here. I, of course, got a little bit ahead of myself. I should have used an action token to do that explore. Ranja is also going to do a move and an explore because we also need food. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you use all of your resources to get units out. You then have none to actually use to move around. Now, that's poor planning on my part, but I really wanted those units out. Remember that units cannot go through walls, but our heroes certainly can. So we're going to move here and then flip it over. And we have the Kushi's Tavern. Gain three food. Heck yeah. If empty, place one garrison here. If not, reinforce here. Plus, take a quest action for zero total action points with plus one blue die. If you fail, ignore any failure effects. Oh my gosh. We get plus one blue die for this. Why don't we do the corrupted druid here? Uh, it says, the dreams sent by Yastat bestowed great power and madness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're looking for skulls, shields, and lightning bolts. So I will roll two red, I'll roll two blue, and let's do one orange. We just need one success here. So we have one, two, three, four. We have four skulls. With four skulls, we'll gain one victory point and remove all activation tokens from one horde and discard this quest. So that means the counter of omens will not be activating this round. Sweet! One victory point will also push us up to 11. I apparently don't want to show you any of the cool terrain effects whenever we do combat because what I'm going to do is attack that sea tower and that sea tower once again is an ice waste. So that means no effects, we're just going to be rolling our dice, but we're spending one food moving into that hex. Remember that Syndra can move through barriers, so she'll move into here. We'll definitely bring the two archers for two. We'll bring in one here for three, one in here for four. And should we do an archer? Another archer? It's a white die. Yeah, another archer for five. We'll roll three white dice for the garrison. They have one shield. We're rolling three white dice and a purple die. And we get two, so that means we'll just take out one part of the garrison. So one part is down, and we gain one victory point. That'll put us up to 12. The garrison is now at level two, so it'll be one blue, two orange, and a white. We'll give the garrison's dice a roll. That's two damage coming in. Okay, I'm going to set these aside. I'm rolling three white, one red, and one purple. We'll roll these up. Okay, I've got a shield and one, two, three, four damage. That'll be enough to destroy the garrison, and they only deal us one damage. With that one damage, let's just lose... Oh, man, they're so expensive. But one son of the bow, that will be placed into their victory uh, graveyard. You know what? I'm going to take that back. Before the damage, we're going to flip this to gain one shield for every Beastmaster that's here. We have one Beastmaster, so that means we have one additional shield to block that. So we took no losses, and we gained two more victory points. We'll move from 12 up to 14. Wow, that was awesome. That garrison is somewhat easy pickings, so let's go ahead and do a command with Ranja and take it out. 
This is a marshland as well, but it's not really going to matter for this combat. I will say the only bad thing is, is I have no ranged characters here, so I'm bringing in all four of my cell swords. Because it's difficult to have combat in the marshes, all red dice become white dice for both attack types. Of course, I'm only rolling orange dice, and they're only rolling white or blue dice, so that doesn't really matter. We'll roll a single white die. Ah, they do take out one of our cell swords. So we're gonna lose a cell sword. They'll then roll one white and one blue die and they get nothing. And we're going to roll three of these and we annihilate that garrison. So that garrison is gone and we'll gain a VP. That'll push us up to 12 VP. What do you say we do a quest with Syndra this time? We have intercept the Empress's caravan. So we need four skulls, one shield or two lightning bolts. If we can get two lightning bolts, you guys, and that'd be great with magic, it's very likely we can gain three salt. But we do need to get two successes for this. If we do, we can gain one item from the market, even if you cannot use it and then discard this quest. And I should say, if your hero is on an iced waste, which we are, uh, that's the whole reason I want to do this. We're going to add a red die. So we're going to roll one red, three purple, and then I have two guile. And I think I'm going to do, I need four skulls. Uh, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is two of the oranges. Come on, four skulls and two lightning bolts. One, two, three, four, five skulls and two lightning bolts. That's what I'm talking about. So this is amazing. We will gain two victory points. We'll gain three salt. I'm going to grab the three salt now so I don't forget. That is awesome. And we can gain an item from the market. We'll move ourselves up to 16 total victory points. That's if I can reach it. Without a doubt, we're going to grab this dragon fruit because we can discard this and gain five total food. Each other player gains two food. Yeah, that's amazing. We'll then replenish that with clash. If your enemy dies, show any blanks, gain one shield. Oh, I really want that. What do you say we keep clearing out those garrisons, shall we? We're going to do a move followed by another explore for Ranja. Let's go ahead and move here and see what we find. We hopefully are going to get some more food. We have gained two food. If empty, place two garrisons here. It's not. Uh, instead, we're going to reinforce. So we're going to have a level three garrison plus place two garrisons on an empty hex. Oh my goodness. And this is a Badlands location. We're starting to run out of empty hexes. <laughs> I will place a level two garrison here. And of course, I need to place my hero in this space. And I do, you know what? I'm going to do something here. I'm going to rearrange this. I've placed it now where there's a barricade between the capital and here. So that way, the executioner, is that the one that's coming to, uh, towards us? Yeah, it cannot move into this space. Before I move to Sonya's turn, I'm pretty sure I've been using the teleport wrong. It's only used during the action phase, but it doesn't take an action to use this. Instead, you can, during the action phase, pay one salt to have her teleport. That makes this a lot better than what I was thinking. Syndra's next action will simply be to do a market action. She is still at a sea tower location, so she gets one discount for that. She has the caravans, so she gets a two salt discount. So she's going to spend one salt to get the clash card. And she can do that because she has a magic level of three. So she'll pay one salt for that, and she now has that ability. We'll then draw the next item, and we have the Kern of Malice. Discard this, you and your enemy gain one black die every combat round. Whoa. I know it's a level three garrison and all, but I think we're still going to be able to do it. We're going to spend a food and command our units into that location. We can only pull in a total of five units. I'm going to bring in these three because I don't want to leave them there. I want to bring a rider in and I'm going to bring a single archer. I really wish I could bring in a second archer but I don't think that's viable. So it's going to be us five versus that garrison. If you see here for the Badlands, rider units add their dice for archery attacks. The garrison is rolling three white dice. They get absolutely nothing. We're rolling a white and a red die and we get one hit oh, and we get one lightning bolt. We're definitely going to place one of our units from any graveyard in any explored hex without any enemy units. But we do that after damage uh, once per combat. That one damage will remove this garrison and will gain one victory point going up to 13. 
Now it's the garrison's turn to do clash. We've got two skulls and we've got a shield. Ouch. We're rolling a lot of dice though. Three orange, one white, and one red. We'll roll them up. Oh my gosh. So we have one, two, three, four. Uh, minus one from that shield is three. So we've totally taken out the garrison. But the garrison will deal us a total of two damage. So we'll lose two of these cell swords. But we'll remove two of the garrisons. And actually, yeah, yeah, two of the garrisons and gain uh, two XP. I will definitely take the 2 XP that pushes us up to 15. We're definitely going to grab a Berserker that's in the graveyard. We'll place it here in our haven. Syndra could just sit here all day going to the market. <laughs> We're going to go to the market getting a 2 salt discount. And we can buy this black fire. Gain 1 salt to gain 1 uh, white dye. Ranja's next turn, we're going to command yet again, and we're going to spend one food, so we have two food left. We have two skeletons here. Now, we're not going to be able to get rid of this curse, but I can move all of these units to here to take out those two skeletons so they do not become a horde right next to our haven. We have two archers there, so we get to roll two white and one blue, thanks to our crossfire. And we roll and take out one of these uh, skeletons. That's going to gain us one XP. We're now both at 16 XP. Then we'll go ahead and roll the one red die for the one skeleton during the clash phase. Okay, just one damage. We'll roll two white. We'll roll a purple. And we'll roll a red. Uh, so we're doing one damage. And we just need to deal one damage. We don't have any damage. Uh, so we're going to lose one of these. Oh, that's such a bummer. Okay, well, that um, nothing I can do about it. We're going to roll for that skeleton again. Nothing, thank goodness. We now have a red. We have a purple and one white. We'll roll these up. I just need one. Oh, that's a lightning bolt, which, by the way, is totally useless in that location because there's a curse. So that skeleton will not give up. Let's go back to the skeleton. He'll roll a nothing again. We'll roll R3. We just need one skull. There it is. That will take this guy out. That'll move us up to 17 victory points. And we've cleared out the, the uh, skeleton infestation. Syndra is going to start her turn by spending one salt. She is going to teleport herself to any hex and then do an explore at that hex. We need some plunder so I can build one more haven. So let's go to this one. We'll flip it over. And we have the Duncan Holm. Gain two plunder. Thank goodness. Then it says remove any skeletons. There aren't any skeletons. And place two garrisons here. Each player will draw one feet, then discard one feet. And I think we're going to place the tile like so, having the barrier here. This looks like another great place to put a haven. And then we just have to protect the edges from the chaos. Ranja grabbed the Rebel Marksman. I like this one. And Syndra chose Assassins. I, I think I'm just going to discard the Assassins. I don't love that one, but this one. Flip this to reroll any of your white dice in archery. I'm going to keep that. And I think I'm going to discard my Berserker here. Ranja's final action, we're going to quest. We have the Druidic Prophetess. My blooming is near. We must crawl quick, reach far, and dig deep. Uh, we need to have two successes on one of these. We could place one basic unit. That's awesome. Or place one basic unit on any of our havens. If we fail, though, we give Chaos two victory points. We're rolling two red, two blue, and I chose white for my guile. Let's see. That is a terrible roll. That gives me one shield. That means I failed this entire quest. When you fail a quest, even if you pass one part of it, it doesn't count. If this was a one, we would have succeeded. I would have gained this benefit and this. But since we failed, we just do this. Chaos gains two victory points and we discard this. Chaos will move from eight to ten victory points. Syndra has one more action left as well. Spending her last salt, she's going to move wherever she wants. And then she's going to do the haven action, dropping down two plunder to place out her third haven. You better believe I know where we're placing that haven. It's going to be right here, and we'll place Syndra right here. We're now going to move to the Nemesis phase, activating the Legions and Hordes. The first one would be the Imperial Guard at 12. We're going to activate him. He does have an activation token. Remember that the, the Counter of Omens does not have one. That's why I forewent trying to take him out. <laughs> Maybe not a good idea because he's going to get super powerful, but it is what it is. 
First thing that happens is we have to place one garrison in the location that they're at or gain one VP if there already are three in that hex and it's not the capital. Now, if it is the capital, they're just going to place a garrison out in an adjacent location that is empty. There's only one adjacent location that's empty and that's right here. Then we need to move the Legion one hex closer to its target. First, its target is into a haven. Can't do that. Into a hex with enemy units. It's not going to be able to do that because there is a barrier. If none of these apply into an empty hex, they don't have one of those. Uh, it says a hex with a curse or a garrison is not empty. Any hex closer to its target. That's going to be that one. Remember, that was the whole reason we put this barrier here so that he cannot move through here. The closest way that he can go is this way to get to this um, this haven right here so next time he'll be able to get to here but i'm hoping that then what i can do is build up some forces and come here and at least deal him some good damage we're then going to do the same thing with the executioner unfortunately there's no adjacent space that's empty so we're actually going to power up right behind him one of these uh, garrisons for the activation and then it's going to simply move one hex closer and that's going to be here uh, trying to get towards its target we'll then gain resources we've got three two three here for uh, ranja we'll add a total of two four five salt to the three we already have there that's eight salt we'll also add one plunder and one food on Syndra's side we have five two one we'll add one to each of those We'll then also add four more salt. So that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten salt, three plunder, and two food. Now let's move to scoring. The Empire will score one victory point for each garrison. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Golly, seven of them. One for each legion. So that's two, so that's nine. And then two for each faction in their discard pile. They have two. So that's 11, uh, 13. 13 victory points. That puts them up to 20 total victory points so far. Chaos will score a point for every curse in play. They have one, two, three, four curses. They have one horde in play, so that's five. And then they have one faction in their discard pile, so that's seven, seven points. So we have 20 and 19 total victory points respectively. We're actually going to be in the lead after this because we're going to score two victory points for each haven. We each have three havens, so that's six victory points. We each control two special locations, so that's a total of eight victory points for each of us. That puts us up to 25 and 24 victory points respectively. We're still doing okay, but uh, chapter three, it's definitely, it, it would definitely be a challenge. I do think at this point, I've shown you enough of the game. I'm exhausted. <laughs> it's a lot to do all this recording. I hope this helped you see how the game plays though. It is super fun. It is fun to see your factions grow and how you're going to deal with these hordes. I do want to show you a chapter three and chapter four card quick, just so you can see what they look like. Here's a chapter three card. It's placing out a legion at a level six. It's going to get two activation tokens. And if you are playing with three or four players, you'd actually place out two more hordes. We would only place out one more horde. Still fun. Here is the chapter four. And look at this place two skeletons on every C tower. So if I didn't have anything there to just take out our havens. Oh my gosh. For each player, place one horde at threat level seven. For each that you cannot, place one legion. Activate the horde with the lowest initiative. It'll just immediately activate. Oh my gosh. Just so much fun. Overall, I have to say I really like the game. I do feel like it plays the best at three to four players. Uh, two factions, I'm actually doing really well here. I do think it helped that I was able to take out one of these uh, hordes. If I had not taken out a horde, and if you look here, what I've got three bosses on the board. I, I would be spawning one to two more. It's going to get overwhelming really quick. <laughs> uh, I do have some good units out, so we just have to see how my dice rolling would do. But overall, I do really like this game. I find the questing, the items, the level up of your hero versus your factions, and then with the expansion providing four more factions. Oh my gosh, so much, so much fun stuff. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Make sure to check out Mike's review. It'll be out in a week or so, and I will catch you at the next stop.